All right, welcome back to another episode of the Cody Tucker Show. I am he, that is Cody Tucker. Today I am joined by a very special guest, Mr. Earl Skakel. How you doing, man? I'm good, you know, just uh, writing uh, a lot of jokes and uh, just got off a of hot yoga and let's uh, start the weekend. Hell yeah. Do you do, how often do you do hot yoga? I do it... Uh, monday through friday sometimes saturday and then i uh, do you know on the day i don't do it or two days i don't do it i'll i'll do a, a hike or a walk the dog for a very long walk um because i I've, I've never had a drink in my life or a drug really so yeah yeah so my uh coping mechanism for uh depression and whatnot in this business of comedy uh is uh i have to have an outlet or yeah, you, know, yeah. I, you know probably it would end up like many of my comrades yeah yeah well i mean exercise is definitely the better one to have i usually just do you know like uh self-loathing so you know that's <laughs> hey whatever <laughs> works you're alive <laughs> dude oh man like yeah that's crazy so before we start i mean before we get really get into it like tell everybody where they can find you like oh like all that that's really easy because i'm at earl skakel that's e-a-r-l-s-k-a-k-e-l everywhere so it's not the earl skakel or underscore backslash it's just earl skakel uh on twitter uh instagram uh, facebook uh tiktok even although i'm not very good at it and uh, if you like podcasts, I'm actually on two. One is my own called Inappropriate Earl, which is yeah. Um, people ask me all the time what what's your podcast about, and it's it's a <laughs> podcast that is about everything and nothing at the same time. Uh, it's '80s metal, it's pro wrestling, uh, a lot of comedy talk, roast battle talk, uh, yeah, animation talk, and then. I'm also on, we're only 10 episodes in, but we're, we're trying to build it, uh, the comedy store wrestling podcast where nice. we, uh, yeah, it's very nice. We've had, uh, some pretty big names. If you follow wrestling, like, uh, yeah. Josh Barnett, who was the, uh, one time UFC heavyweight champ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rock. Yeah. I mean, we, so he's big in the MMA and wrestling world. Um, we've got Rocky Romero, uh, Fred Rossler, who's the first openly gay pro wrestler. Um, and uh, we just had Jasmine St. Clair, the porn star on, who yeah. uh, were like, well, what does she have to do with wrestling? Uh, she was in ECW and XPW. So yeah. uh, I'm. if you can't find me, you're not looking. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find. Yeah. No, dude, we have two like very similar passions, I think. Well, three, really, if you can count, you know, comedy, but uh, like wrestling and eighties metal are like probably my two biggest like loves ever. Like, so that's what's so like, like what's gonna be so cool about this, like the Ric Flair roast. Like how fun is that? Like to get to do this roast with Ric Flair. I mean, I'm beyond excited just because um... I mean, I've been a pro wrestling fan since I was a kid. Um, yeah. And uh, just for some of the other people who are on the, the dais, uh, you know, Vicky Guerrero is on the dais. Yeah, yeah. I remember watching, you know, that's the most famous wrestling family, arguably outside of the Von Erics. Uh, I yeah. remember watching, uh, I think the first really wrestling feud I ever really followed was... Uh, Mondo Guerrero mm -hmm. uh, and Chavo Guerrero, not junior, but senior, yeah, senior. Um, against Moondog Maine, who was, uh, yeah. you know, younger people wouldn't know who he is, but he was like a great bad guy. He would like open a can of dog food and eat it. <laughs> um, so to be able to get to roast any of the Guerreros is pretty uh, amazing. And Eric Bischoff, yeah, um, who's done my podcast. I mean, I actually talked him into coming to my house and doing it. Um, you know, I'm like, it's it's hard to put it into words. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, uh, Eddie George, a very famous football player. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a Tennessee big Titans. 
Yeah, yeah Tennessee Titans. And, yeah. Uh, I'm a huge hockey fan, and Ty Domi's on the day. Oh, okay. Oh, so, like, dude. That's, you know. That's a pretty stacked honest. lineup. Yeah, I mean, Tory Wilson's also on it. Um, oh, man. I think they're going to – I don't want to ruin it because uh, I don't know if these are supposed to be surprises or not. Uh-huh. But uh, there will be some very nice video uh, presentations. You yeah. know, uh, famous wrestlers will be uh, vi- sending in video messages. So uh, – and then, you know, Ric Flair is – yeah, I mean, I mean that's he's the, on everyone's Mount Rushmore, uh, dude. A hundred percent. Like Ric Flair is, I mean, that might be the greatest wrestler of all time. I mean, just like I showmanship mean, he, and yeah. I mean, arguably, you know, it depends when you ask, you know, uh, who who your Mount Rushmore is. You know, I think what era you grew up in. That's it's like Saturday Night Live. You know, yeah. like like whoever was like your kind of adolescence cast, that's who you like. Like so for yeah. me, like I don't give a shit about like John Belushi or Dan Aykroyd, you know, and I'm not like trashing the guys, like, but it just that's not funny to me whenever I go back and watch those. But whenever I watch it from like the early two thousands, super into it. And See, that's to kinda, me, I feel the complete opposite. Like, because I really, grew up yeah. with like to me, Saturday Night Live has never been the same since that original cast. Yeah, uh, it's been good in in right. waves, and you know you had the Sandler, Schneider, Spade, mm-hmm. Arley era, uh, Norm Macdonald. Um, yeah, but in terms of wrestling, like I'm, how old are you? Twenty eight. See, I'm fifty three. So yeah, like, you know my Mount Rushmore would be something along the lines of Hogan, Flair, Sting, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know kamala uh oh really yeah but to some of your age or even younger than you um you know they would literally be like uh who's who's staying that old guy in (laughs) that's insane or the singer of the police yeah yeah uh (laughs) or you know when i tell because you could really when you talk about wrestling you could break down your mount rushmore's to Mm -hmm. um different the categories like who are the top four bad guys right like uh, the heels and faces yeah and, yeah and you know i told someone the we did this on the comedy store wrestling podcast the other day with jasmine i, I, mm-hmm. I think they asked me my my top four uh bad guys and i mentioned sid vicious oh um, that's a great one well once again though if you were my age and saw him in his prime you'd be yeah. like okay i get it he was right. amazing he had the look his uh his promos were unhinged which added to the the character of him being just this monster so was psycho sid after that or before or wasn't he Uh, psycho sid also yeah he was psycho sid he was the sid justice sid i think in ecw um i think he started off uh and smaller promotions Mm -hmm. i'm i'm drawing a blank on uh, lord humongous uh, that's what? okay okay see i do that i mean like with being able to just watch these like stream them like i've gone through and rewatched like you know all of like the um like classic wrestlemanias and gone through and for me like i actually do prefer a wrestling like period before like my time you know like like i didn't i was huge into it as a kid but i kind of fell off of it like pretty young and now i just you know I don't really keep up too much with it. Like I would rather watch like the like Bret Hart matches and people like that. Well, you got to understand, and it's hard to to uh, say this to someone your age or younger. Uh-huh. I sound old saying this, but <laughs> you know I am old. Uh, is that you know before the internet, like you really thought wrestling was real? Um, yeah. You know when I. And I do this joke on stage, but I'll say it here in non-joke form. Um, you know, I really thought Kamala was from Uganda. You yeah. Know? I, re- I remember asking my father, how did they get him over here? Like, you know, like I literally in my mind thought he was brought on a slave ship or whatever. Yeah. And Vince McMahon just had him shackled up and, and they sent him to the ring. Um, and then, you know, once the Internet came about and, and certainly today, anyone listening to this right now could just google kamala harris which 
ironically is that's yeah the same name as our vice president uh but if you put in kamala harris wrestler she always oh, from mississippi you know like within <laughs> six seconds you know oh it, yeah. this isn't real uh right or, you know um or the piper wasn't from scotland like yeah it's from portland uh yeah. or my favorite uh, yeah since this is a uh, video uh, podcast, uh, uh, a fan sent me this one, so I'll do a slow reveal. Um, <laughs> yeah, Abdullah the Butcher, Jesus. <laughs> yes, uh, for those of you uh, just listening and not watching, um, I just showed Cody a Abdullah the Butcher doll. Uh, but as a kid in the early 80s, yeah. I thought, oh, this guy really is a wild man from the Sudan. Yeah, uh, his real name is Larry, and he's from Windsor, Ontario. <laughs> like, but you know, uh, yeah. Well, how would you know? You know, I mean, like, there's there's nothing for, especially as a child. Like, there's nothing to lead you on that this isn't real. I mean, well, yeah, but you now, didn't have I, a debunking machine, you know, in your hand. Like, but I think wrestling now is. Uh, you know, like MJF, yes, he's from Long Island, so that's right. somewhat true. But, uh, you know, you can't bring in a guy like Wardlow. Uh, I'm an mm -hmm. AEW guy, so I'll use yeah, yeah, yeah. some of their wrestlers. Uh, you can't say Wardlow is from Parts Unknown. You know, you could just Google Wardlow. Oh, he's from, uh, you know, wherever he's from, Phoenix or something. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, I actually do prefer the era – that I grew up watching wrestling in because yeah. um, like I was watching the other night, you know, when a stand-up comic gets bored, they just go on YouTube and watch wrestling videos. Uh, Same. Was, yeah. yeah. I think it was a war yeah. games from the late eighties or early nineties. And it was uh -huh. the road warriors. It was uh, Sting. I think Sid. Okay. Yeah. And you know, I, like today, the only problem I have with today's wrestling, especially AEW, which I love, mm -hmm. I much prefer AEW than me WWE. too, for sure. But my only, my only problem with AEW is that the matches are so choreographed. It's like watching ballet. Um, yes, yeah, and it's amazing. Those guys are, and the girls, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable what they do. Um, but this war games match with the road warriors and Sid and I think Vader, I mean, mm -hmm. you had some of the stiffest workers all in one cage. Uh, you thought it was real. Cause they were, there was no ballet going on in this match. It was no. botched power bombs. Uh, Sid at one point, I think picks up sting and the cage was so low uh, because it had a ceiling on it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an, that, he tried to power bomb him and literally he maybe brought him up 40% of the way because the, the cage was so low. Yeah. So it had an era of realism. For uh, sure. You know, that today's wrestling doesn't. Um, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a thing that I've definitely noticed. And it's it kind of goes with like a lot of movies. Like, I mean, you can pinpoint that to a lot of things where like if you watch a movie like uh, Bullet or Death Wish or something like that, it seems slightly more real than if you watch like a Jason Statham movie or something like that, or like expendables, or you're like, this is just too, like, it's too perfect. Yeah. If, no, if I, that makes sense. I showed my last girlfriend who was your age, actually. Hello. Nice. Uh, right. <laughs> I, uh, you know, she's obviously grown up like you to the fast and furious movies. Yeah. And, uh, stuff like that. And I said, let me show you Stallone's movie Cobra. Oh um, God. Yeah which uh i think one of the my this isn't like a subtle way to plug my own podcast but like i had the bad guy from cobra on uh inappropriate earl and nice. it was awesome like <laughs> it was a zoom interview he's in his kitchen without a shirt off and he's still jacked yeah uh, but if you watch cobra any kid your age or younger you feel like you're almost watching a documentary like because it looks so real very uh, very much yeah versus like you know i, I think uh, i'm trying to think of the last special effects movie like the last top gun movie uh, yeah. well the only maverick yeah you know that i much prefer the original um oh a hundred percent 
And, you know, I think if, if they never made Top Gun and, and Maverick was the first, and you go, okay, this is a pretty good movie. But, yeah. uh, you know, I like the low or minimalist special effects movies of the 80s. Yes. Uh, you know, and some still stand up. Some don't. Um, right. Like I showed a friend of mine the other day, uh, her favorite James Bond I think this goes into the wrestling and, and uh-huh. really probably everything. Uh, I, I think when you ask someone who their favorite James Bond is, like, who is yours? So, I mean, mine is actually uh, George Lazenby, <laughs> which well, I know is that, but I know what you mean. Like, it should be Daniel Craig. Right. Like, or my Batman should be Christian Bale, but mine's Val Kilmer. Like, it's, you know, I, I, I get yeah, what no. you mean. Yeah. I mean, like hers is Daniel Craig because for uh, sure she is um, she's in her thirties, but you know that's very young to me. Yeah. And uh, I said, let me show you Roger Moore James Bond, and, right? Because uh, my two favorite James Bond movies are the they're actually back to back: The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. Um, oh, really? Moonraker? Well, because I love Jaws, the bad guy. Uh, yeah, um, Richard. Richard Keel. Keel. Yeah. And, uh, I made the mistake of showing her Moonraker first because <laughs> that's when they turned Jaws into almost a cartoon character. Yeah. Uh, whereas the first one, The Spy Who Loved Me, he was more of a badass. Uh, For sure. But, uh, you know, I, I grew up with Roger Moore. So, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm actually, you know, you think you're weird saying so you like George Lazenby the best. I yeah. love the two that Timothy Dalton I did. I do too. I really like the Timothy Dalton ones. But well, I think the I think the problem with Timothy Dalton was he was too good of an actor. Like exactly. Exactly too good of an actor. I think he walked into it going uh I'm going to bring in my Shakespearean background. <laughs> no, yeah, I think he 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 was like legit. No, he was looking. yeah. Uh, he was overqualified to play James Bond. Um, yeah. And yeah. and his two James Bond movies, this is right when AIDS was you uh-huh. know starting to I mean it was well I think his first James Bond was 87. So I mean obviously AIDS had been around but yeah. Unfortunately for him he, he wasn't really they turned James Bond into like a one woman guy. Right, right. And uh although I did like in the second one where uh, Robert Davi was the bad guy. I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they turned James Bond angry. Uh, yeah. So I like, and I think it was Benicio del Toro's first film. Um, is that that one? Yeah, that's the okay. one. Uh, yes, that, that is. Yeah. It's the one with Wayne Newton and it, yeah. they, um, and Robert Davi's the bad guy, mm-hmm. uh, Sanchez. and uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's so, right. Benicio del Toro is kind of like his like hit like henchman like top level yeah. right yeah 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 he literally yeah. had I don't think he had more than five lines in the whole movie uh, yeah he was almost playing a Jaws like character you mm-hmm. know? Um, so uh, you know that's a great way to test generation gaps you know it, it's like yeah. there's, there's some people who prefer the new Star Wars where some of my age it's nah. the first three and I don't even really acknowledge the others i'm no see i i think i just have such a fascination with like pop culture in general that like i want to know like where it comes from and so like constantly watching older things and like going back and then well what was before that and what was before that so i've gotten like an appreciation of you know maybe a different era than what i probably should being my age but I know what you mean. I mean, it's a huge generation gap, and you can pinpoint it with anything. Music, I mean, wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, if you ask people their favorite era of Kiss, you know, <laughs> who has been around for, I mean, my God, almost 50 years at this point. Yeah, you know? it's like 74, I think. Yes, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think their first album was 74, and, and so yeah. a lot of fans like the original four and nothing else. You know, it's Gene, Paul, Ace, and Peter. I'm kind of that way. I mean, I'm uh, oddly enough, and, and maybe because the '80s was my teenage, uh, you know, it was when I first started getting into girls and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I really like their '80s output. You know, Benny Vincent, 
Hell, Eric Carr, know. right? Eric Carr. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Even the one album with Mark St. John, who was like mm-hmm. the George Lazenby of Kiss. He was only yeah. there for one album. Um, <laughs> the Gary Sharon. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were like, you know, and I've said this on a few podcasts that a Kiss did something that I don't think I've ever seen another band musically do is from 79, which was Dynasty, mm-hmm. to really Revenge, or really even Carnival of Souls in 94. Mm-hmm. Every album was a different musical genre, uh, you know, because they were chasing trends, you know. Yeah. You know, when disco was in, they put out um, Dynasty. When uh, a band like The Cars, who's one of my favorite bands, mm-hmm. uh, when they were big, they put out, Kiss put out Unmasked, which was basically right. a Cars album. And, and et cetera, you know, Bon Jovi got big, they put out Crazy Nights. They literally hired Desmond Child, who mm-hmm. wrote all of Bon Jovi's hits, uh, or co-wrote, you know, yeah. his Bon Jovi would say, hey, I wrote them too. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, even when grunge, if you listen to Carnival of Souls, that's a great Stone Temple Pilots album. Like, <laughs> Very much. Dude, I've never thought about it like that. It, yeah, Kiss is definitely a band that did that. I think Van Halen to an extent, but not the same level. But also you have the, you know, the luxury of getting Sammy Hagar, which I don't know how you feel about any of that, but... Yeah, I mean, I I like both to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think uh, you know, and I like the David Lee Ross solo band. Uh, those first few albums. Yeah, I got to uh, have Billy Sheehan on the podcast. Oh. Amazing dude, and um, and like getting ready for that. Which I I mean, I knew like David Lee Ross solo music, but I like really was digging deep into it, kind of you know getting ready for that i was like god man that solo music like his solo career is so underrated yeah i mean it was basically van halen with steve Vai in the band uh <laughs> you know, i mean yeah uh, if you look at his first solo band uh you know uh, eat him and smile i'm talking about that album yeah uh, uh, you know you had billy sheehan who's one of the great bass players of the last 50 years for sure uh, Steve Vai, uh, I mean, one of maybe two or three that you could say is in Van Halen's class. Yeah. Uh, and probably the least talked about guy might have been the best musician in the band, uh, Greg Bizanet, the drummer. Um, yeah. You know, who does like jazz fusion when he's not playing in a, like an 80s metal band. So yeah. uh, musically, that band was as good as Van Halen in terms of the talent. Very um, much. But yeah. Uh, you know, Hagar brought in, he, you know, he's probably a more well-rounded performer than Roth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I think uh, so. Yeah. You know, much like the original Kiss, uh, you know, if you look at Ace Frehley, he's probably the worst guitar player that's ever played in Kiss <laughs> from a technical <laughs> standpoint. I, I agree. Yeah. But he's clear by far and away, he's the most popular. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's really just whatever you like. And, um, you, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's like the Rolling Stones right now. Mm-hmm. You know, they have, uh, I think, Steve Hunter on drums. Steve Jordan. Uh, so I'm Steve Hunter. I think he's yeah. a player from uh, Alice Cooper. <laughs> I was uh, going to say, yeah, yeah, Steve Jordan. Yeah, I just saw them in November uh, at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, and they were amazing. The Rolling oh, Stones. I mean, that- yeah, Rolling Stones. I just think it's funny there's two black guys now in the Rolling Stones. Yeah. <laughs> Like Daryl Jones is the bass player. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, technically, and it's no offense to Charlie Watts or Bill Wyman, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, uh, those two guys are amazing musicians. Dude. Yeah. But people, like, don't care. It's like, I, if they're not Charlie Watts, that's not Bill Wyman. So, it doesn't bother me too much, to be honest. I mean, well, I mean, it's one thing, you know, in Charlie Watts' case, he'd still be in the band if he was alive. Uh, you know. Right. Bill Wyman was long gone, I think. I mean, yeah, I mean, Daryl Jones has been in them for, my God, uh, 25 years. Uh, yeah. So I've always found that funny that, you know, here's this guy. He's not allowed in the pictures just because I think the mm-hmm. Stones are like, hey, we're OGs. It's OGs yeah. only. And you yeah. know he goes up to chicks at a nightclub and hey, I, I'm in the Rolling Stones. <laughs> they pull up pictures on a smartphone, going, "I don't see one picture of you, dude." Uh, 
you know, if it's kind of yeah. like, um, I thought one thing I, I seen with a band uh, where death affected their roster was the cars when uh, Benjamin Orr died. Yeah. I saw the, uh, the four remaining members play at the Palladium. They did a reunion tour mm -hmm. and they just programmed Greg Hawks, the keyboard player. He just programmed Benjamin Orr's parts and they didn't, they didn't have a bass player on stage. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. I like that actually. Like, I mean, I, they did, um, when I saw the new cars, which was before the cars reunion, I, I think, what was it? I think, uh, Elliot Easton and Greg uh -huh. Hawk, they wanted to start playing again. And I think they reached out to Rick Ocasek and David Robinson, who was the drummer. Yeah. They didn't want to do it at the time. So they said, well, you guys can do it, but you can't call it the cars. You can call it the new cars. Yeah. Uh, so they had Todd Rundgren uh, singing uh, Kasim Sultan on bass, who's his mm -hmm. amazing bass player, um, and uh, the drummer from the Tubes, which I really loved because I, yeah. I love the Tubes. Um, and, uh, you know, it was amazing. Probably a better version of the cars, but it's like mm -hmm. when you look at Kasim Sultan, who's a – virtuoso on bass mm -hmm. i just kept going that's not benjamin Orr." uh yeah and yeah. the funny thing is i once randomly saw todd rundgren walking on my street uh, <laughs> a couple years ago and he looked like he was lost and i said hey man are you lost i'm a big fan and he, i think mm -hmm. he was looking for the supermarket and i'm like let's right down there and before i let you go i just wanted you to know i loved you in the new cars and he looked at me and he's like, you were about <laughs> the only one, bro. Because yeah. <laughs> that's his sense of humor. You can yeah, tell yeah, you know, that, yeah. was, that didn't work. But, but I yeah. love it. So yeah. Uh, so did you? I mean, you grew up in L.A., right? Yeah, I grew up right off the Sunset Strip. So yeah, which is why I probably like Kiss in the '80s more than most people. Like, yeah. uh, you know, because I was there. You know, I, yeah. I, I saw the Sunset Strip at its absolute peak. Um, and it's, it's so hard to explain to someone like you, uh, you know, I, I feel old once again, say, oh, you had to be there. But <laughs> but it's true. I mean, what I mean, am I? It, all I can do is watch a documentary about it. But the it's documentaries, true. they don't even come close to covering what no, I saw. Um, for sure. The Sunset Strip on a Friday, Saturday night, uh, it was like an ant farm of horny people. I mean, it was just girls look like guys, guys look like girls. <laughs> Uh, and this was before, you know, obviously MySpace or Facebook, yeah, yeah. Instagram, you know, like I'm on the Ric Flair rose. So All I can right. go on my computer right now, put the picture they just sent me. Hey, everyone, July 29th, Nashville. This is where I'll be. But back then, if you had a concert or whatever, you the band Poison, let's say, literally mm -hmm. the four members of Poison went to a print shop, had a thousand flyers made and had to go on the street themselves. And put their posters up. Yeah. And then 20 minutes later, Warren. It's kind of like mm. a hairspray version of the <laughs> Bloods and the Crips. <laughs> Warren would put their flyers over poison yeah. flyers. And right. Crap, same yeah. thing. It turns into like a, a turf war between yeah. glam metal. If you, you had call to it hit that. the streets. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you were in the LA metal scene. Um, so. Uh, it was, to, and you know, unlike, you know, like tonight, you know, if you want to go out, you want to see a comedy show, but you're feeling a little tired or lazy, or you maybe got a chick that's coming over or a dude, whatever you're into. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, either you one, just, yeah. yeah, whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah. I mean, the hole's a hole after midnight. Um, oh, for sure. Close but, your eyes. Uh, and, yeah. yeah, close your eyes and aim. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you were tired tonight and you had someone coming over, let's just watch Netflix. Uh, yeah or Hulu or whatever you watch, you know, back then you had to go out. Like, yeah. you know, if you wanted to see a movie, you couldn't say, Hey, let's, uh, let's see what's on Amazon tonight. You yeah, go to yeah. the movie theater. So everyone went out back then. So it was just, there was no social media, which I yeah. kind of prefer to be honest with you, but. Um, I, yeah. If it know, wasn't like, such a necessary evil, you know, I wouldn't fuck with it one bit. Like oh, social yeah, media but, and any of that, but I yeah, have to, yeah, yeah. It's like being on the Rick Flair roast. I have to put on, I have to put the picture on Twitter. Hey, look at me. Yeah. Instagram. Hey, look at me. 
uh, Facebook. Hey, look at me. Well, look what yeah. I'm doing. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. But, yeah. And not to, you know, and anytime like, yeah, exactly. Like anytime I'm on like doing a set somewhere, like I want to try to make sure people come out and like, it's kind of the same thing. Like, I'm just like, I really hate that I f- have to do this, but I mean, I guess it's just one of those things. Like I'd rather just go and do it. And then, you know, yeah. I mean, I'd rather be like, Hey, I'm funny. Go see your (laughs) steak alive. That's just not how the business works. Yeah. You you have to, uh, I mean, I've seen, I'm starting to see TikTok celebrities get stand up time because, uh, well, I mean, the clubs will sink or swim depending on how good they are, which not all, but most are pretty bad because they don't put in the work. Right. Uh, but they have a million followers and they can you know, not tweet out, but make a TikTok video. Hey, I'll be at the comedy store tonight or the laugh factory. Or, right. You know, even if just point oh one 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 percent show up, that's 50 mm-hmm. people in the crowd. Exactly. So, but I guess the good thing is like, you know, they get found out real fast that they're not, they're not really like ready for this. You know what I mean? Like, it, I think stand up is a hard thing to just like fake. Well, I mean, that's what I love about the comedy store. They don't care if you have a million followers on TikTok. Yeah. Are you funny? Because right. We believe in something called repeat business. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, if you look at most TikTok people or reality, uh, I remember once, and she was a nice person, like it's nothing personal. Uh, I'm about to go on stage. And at the time I had a, at the comedy store, mm-hmm. I had a pretty low social media following and Rocky from below deck came on. I yeah. came in the room. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'll just say this: someone very important wanted her to get some stage time. So they were like, okay. you mind if she goes on ahead of you. And, uh, I was like, well, I kind of do, but given who wants her on the stage, yeah, go ahead. And, yeah. she, and she's nice enough, but she went up there and literally after like 10 seconds, she just looks at the crowd and goes, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> uh, and yeah. you know, she was very nice. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think you get a lot of that, um, you know, and I think, you know, people see like someone like Theo Vaughn who came <laughs> from the reality show world and they think, right. oh, I can do what he did. But like Theo works incredibly hard. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, obviously it's an example people will use, but it's not a good one. Cause like that dude is a actual comedian Yeah, he made but with the done. work, you know, like, I mean, and Christ, oh. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of people who have started off like in a different medium, but if they work hard enough, then it does not matter like how they started. It's like, did you put in the work to like, get to where you're at? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think, uh, I mean, Theo, I knew him back when he started, like he was a maniac. He, he would, we had a very similar work ethic where we, you know, mm. we would do shit like we'd do a comedy contest literally in San Diego for free. As soon as yeah. the contest was over, we'd drive back to uh, Los Angeles and, and try mm. and get on an open mic that same night. Uh, you know, we were maniacs. Um, yeah. Like I don't see uh, Brendan Schaub doing that. Like, um, yeah. And like, once again, I've done, I think one show with him. He was very nice to me. Yeah. He, nothing personal when I say this, but like, you know, the jury's out on him being funny because, right. You know, he doesn't put in the work from the standpoint of, yeah. uh, he's not doing open mics. He's not waiting for two hours to try out new jokes. Yeah. Uh, so, well, yeah, he has yeah. two specials. Oh yeah. I mean, I, it's, which, yeah, I mean, I, 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 like I don't know how like you feel about this and I'm really new to stand up so maybe I'm I don't have like a leg to stand on but I feel like having a special is something that should happen way down the road. I don't know if that's well, maybe I mean, a bad way of thinking cuz it's different for different people but it just seems like that's like I mean you got to be so seasoned, you know. I mean that you know it, it's tough to say you don't know you're ready until you're until you do it. And then, yeah, you know, like six years into comedy, I tried out for the tonight show because I thought I was ready um, and I wasn't. So, yeah, but I didn't know that until I bombed at the audition. Um, True. You know, I, I think in Shab's case, I'll guess 
it was really hard for him because all his friends at the time, and they're probably still his friends, you know, Rogan, multiple specials, yeah, Delia, multiple specials, Callan, multiple specials. And I'm sure yeah. he was like, I want to do at least one special. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that's just not how it works. I mean, I, you know, I watched the special because so many people were asking me about it. You know, it was rough, but, you know, yeah. He's, uh, you know, he made the call that, you know, if I were his manager and it's funny, I knew his manager at the time mm -hmm. and the manager is a, a very famous actors manager. Uh, like he manages huge actors and yeah, he called me in for a meeting about a cartoon idea for me, but, uh, you know, Shab's name came up and he was like, well, what would you do? Cause he had no, um, he didn't have a lot of uh, experience representing standups. So I, it's mm -hmm. funny. I said to him, well, whatever you do, don't give him a special. He's not ready. <laughs> and I meant that like he'd been doing comedy maybe a couple of years. Uh, he's yeah. lucky if he has 10 minutes. Um, and I said, what you should do is have him do like uh, a Brendan Schaub and Friends where he hosts. And, and yeah. He, He's probably got five passable minutes for television. Mm -hmm. And you could either do it, it's Brendan Schaub and friends, and you have like three of his famous friends, like Rogan, Callan, and Dalia, and they're doing new material or, or some gimmick like that. Right, right, right. Or you could have it three unknown comics like me, uh, Sarah Tiana, and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, Omid Singh. Uh, okay yeah you know, showcase like hey here's the next group of comics you should know uh yeah but you know they gave him the because that way you know he, he would just have to host do five minutes up top and then like 30 seconds in between each act yeah you know, hey here's earl skakel give it up earl and, and uh but you know uh yeah. that first special was not favorably reviewed just because no. like because at that point, I think he'd been doing comedy maybe three years. I think so. Yeah. And I don't even really count what he was doing as a full three years. Like he would do really just Rogan shows at the improv or the comedy store. Mm -hmm. um, so he'd do maybe two shows a week. Uh, yeah. And like my first three years of comedy, and I'm sure it was the same for Theo. I was a maniac. I mean, I was yeah. going up literally seven nights a week three times a night so i would say on average uh i went up 20 to 25 times a week um, i mean i i was a maniac i mean i would go see, even on an off night i'd go see say kiss in concert in like irvine mm -hmm. which is orange, orange county for people who don't know where Irvine is yeah and i would go okay well rock and roll all night that's going to be the last song so i would literally stand by the exit I'd watch them. And as soon as they said goodnight, I would run to my car and I would drive to the Valley, which is about an hour and a half drive from Irvine to do an open mic. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I would say my first three years in comedy, I had the experience level of someone who was almost at the 10 year mark. I mean, yeah, I was relentless. So, but, but that's okay. kind of like but that kind of goes back to the like um those bands that you're talking about like bands like motley crew poison stuff like that like the amount of work that they had to put into it just to stand out in any way if you weren't putting in that work i mean there's 50 other bands that are ready okay. to jump ahead of you no oh, yeah and i think but in shop's case you know he uh survived that first special not being so good because he's famous and uh, yeah and he's a very successful podcaster. So right. that, that you know, podcasting has now helped some bad comics survive bad specials uh, or, you know, uh, right. sloppy work ethics. Because you can just, you know, say, hey, uh, I'm Earl Skakel. Tonight I'll be at the comedy store. And it's packed. I have to do virtually no work. Yeah. But it's also easy, I think, for somebody like him when you are surrounded by funny people. So not just having a, su a successful podcast or multiple, but having those with people who are legit comics, it's easy to kind of like fake funny a little bit. 
You know what I mean? Like, you, cause you can bounce off people a little bit easier. So you're not having to like come up with things necessarily on your own. And that's kind of a lot of what I've seen with people, you know, like that. Well, I think that, and that's once again, I, that's why I love the comedy store so much is you can't really fake funny up there. Like, yeah, uh, I was on a lineup the other night. It might have been the greatest lineup I've ever been on. I mean, this was the lineup, and it might not have been in this order, but uh-huh. I, I'm a huge hockey guy, so uh, I had a yeah. lot of the Los Angeles Kings there to see me. Nice. So I was super nervous because I was like, oh, God, I don't want to bomb in front of these guys. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, the lineup was, you know, Craig Fitzsimmons, okay. uh, Anthony Jeselnik, Mark Marin, Jesus. Uh, Stephen Fury, who's this brilliant comic. Yeah. Who, you will know who he is soon. Um, uh, Bert Kreischer, uh, Ryan Sickler. Uh, so, and then I went on last and, uh, you know, you can't fake funny on that lineup. No, 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 no. And Brian Simpson was, Oh uh, yeah. 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 So, you know, that's home run hitter after home run hitter. And, and if, if you're not, fu- and Steph Tola was a really funny uh-huh. uh, comic from Toronto. Uh, so, you know, if you're a comic, who's trying to take shortcuts or, or cheat the system on that lineup, you would be exposed within 10 seconds. Right. So, right. Uh, you know, that's, that's where your work ethic, be it strong or poor will show up. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, I mean, I guess that's kind of like where I'm at is just trying to get like as much practice and like, cause, okay. So I was kind of curious, like how you feel about this. Like, did you have in the beginning, or maybe you still have it where it's hard to be in the moment? Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I survived in the early years of my standup because I was so good in the moment. Like, okay. uh, you know, I, I'm, and I don't think I'm a great joke writer now, but you know, I'm more mm-hmm. of a performer. Like I always tell people I'm like the kiss of comics where <laughs> you know, kiss doesn't have the greatest songs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not like you hear that and go, my God, that chord structure was unbelievable, <laughs> but you see them play live and you're like, this yeah. is the greatest band I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I did a lot of bad rooms back in the day, you know, uh, coffee shops where mm. espresso machines were going off in the background. And, uh, you know, I would do gay bars. Uh, you know, I didn't do a lot of black rooms, but I did do some. Yeah. Uh, and so that made me it forced myself to be in the moment because there's just yeah. so many. You know, one time I'm on a sh- I'm on stage in a gang fight broke out in the back room where they're pepper spraying each other and and uh, you know i was basically turned in from doing comedy to being a commentator <laughs> you know <laughs> hey. so uh i i definitely until my writing got stronger uh, mm-hmm. that was my strong point was being in the moment um yeah but luckily at you know places like the comedy store you don't have a ton of distractions from the standpoint of uh, you know, fights breaking out or yeah. pepper spray. Uh, I mean, you do in the main room, you can hear the kitchen. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, and I had a few funny jokes about that, you know, in, in uh, random moments. So, um, you know, you just, my advice to you and really any young comics mm-hmm. is get up as much as you can. You know, it, it's, yeah. there's no shortcuts. It, it's, you can't learn comedy in a comedy school or yeah comedy coach that's all bullshit uh you know you, no. you just, there's no shortcut i mean there are no. shortcuts in comedy but they don't work uh, yeah you know, if you want to be good you know a ralphie may level or a theo or mm-hmm. you know, a bird or, or yeah rogan or russell peters like you know those guys are so big you know like russell peters you know think he never oh, really yeah. got to work that guy was a struggling comic for a while. Oh, um, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, in Canada, you know, he was a feature act and he worked his ass off to get to where he is at. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I don't, you know, Rogan struggled in the early days. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, so Ryan Sickler, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. Segura and, and Ari Shafir, like, I remember doing open mics with Ari Shafir in front of two people. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, I think if you're funny, you know, hard work gets you in the door, but being funny mm-hmm. keeps you in the door. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have to have just talent in general, like hard work is just, yeah, 
it's it's how you get there but you got to still have it to be able to yell i mean i stay. believe so i don't think if you're not funny you're not funny like it's just right. you know like i'm i'm six one uh i have incredibly strong legs but i have no jumping ability um so i could take classes all night long on how to dunk a basketball yeah I am. If I can't jump to the rim in the first place, it's a waste of money. Um, yeah. And so if you're if you're not funny, and, and a lot of people aren't, you can't teach funny. It's just no. It's you're either funny or you're not. But then there is that difference between being the person who is funny, like at work or with their friends, and then having the different level, or not necessarily a different level, but just the different style that helps you be funny on stage. So well, that's I mean, a that's a big difference i think oh yeah i mean well it's it's one thing to make your friends laugh because they know you right um, like uh but you know when you walk on stage at the comedy store or really even an open mic mm -hmm. the crowd doesn't know you so it, you don't exactly have, you don't have that leeway of okay they're gonna laugh just because they know oh, that world's funny guy you know yeah. you walk on stage at the comedy store let's say uh where the tickets are twenty dollars and up you know mm -hmm. the, the parking's probably twenty dollars uh, the drinks or whatever the drinks are so it's an expensive evening yeah and so the crowd i think looks at you as like hey man i paid if you're on a date you know you're looking at a hundred bucks plus yeah uh, plus a dinner that you know uh probably happened elsewhere <laughs> you know you so you know at the end of the day you're looking at a, a couple in the front row or the back row they the guy, unless the girl's paying, probably spent as much as two hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, make me laugh, dude. I don't know you, but yeah, you took my money, so make me laugh. Um, which you know, versus the water cooler at work, mm -hmm. you know, they're you're all there for free, so nobody, yeah, you know, no expectation. Yeah. See, I just have like a guilty conscience like conscience conscience guilty yeah. conscience like if i don't do a good job knowing that people are like here to laugh you know what i mean like like i just am like like i beat myself up about that i've just been like damn like and you know i'm just doing like little open mics and stuff and like a few you know actual shows but like if i have like a, a joke that just kind of falls flat like that shit like will sting to me where i'm like damn like these people came out here and like I feel like I wasted time, you know? But I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, listen, I still bomb every now and then. I'm not yeah. often, but it does happen. Uh, I've seen every big comic in the world not have a great set. Uh, you know, I mean, the other night, uh, maybe two weeks ago, the AC in the original room at the comedy store went out. And it was... And I wear leather pants and leather jackets. Yeah. So I, I was fucking sweating my ass off. Yeah, uh, I mean, I literally, you know, wrestlers walk out, they put Vaseline or water mm. on to look wet or whatever. Yeah. I look like that on stage. And <laughs> uh, I'll be honest, I didn't have the best set. Uh, and I kind of felt bad. You know, like you just said, you, you feel yeah. obligated when people are paying, especially. Um, but I think the crowd understood. I mean, when yeah. they come back to see me, you know, I'm sure some were like, that guy sucked. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm... You know, you just, uh, you know, bomb, everyone bombs, you know, yeah. you successful comics. That's why, you know, when you see a special on TV, they probably did two shows that night. Uh, yeah, yeah, at they least. The, yeah, they took the best from both shows and combined them together with editing. You yeah. know, I mean, very few people whose special you see on air did it in one shot. Um, yeah. So, uh you know, I think you just have to get up the next day and, and and try not to worry about it and, you know, get up the, that night and, and, you know, you uh, have to get back on the horse. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Like, you know, the way to go. I mean, and just not letting like the one person that's not laughing be the one person that I'm focusing on, which I tend to do. Like, why aren't you, why don't you think this is funny? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I do that thing like a lot, which I don't know whether that's a good mindset to have, you know, or not, but 
I mean, you know, I mean, I used to do that a lot, and you know, in the early days, you know, I'd look at, you know, if I was when I started progressing, you know, a little bit like five, six years in, and I yeah. started doing, you know, bigger rooms, and there'd be a hundred people laughing, and and one person not, I would focus on the one person not laughing, going, oh my god, I'm bombing, and, <laughs> and then you realize uh, the other hundred people are laughing. You're, you know, yeah. not everyone's gonna like um, your style of humor. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, I remember once, uh, and I've told this story a lot, but uh, my, I took my friend to the Hermosa Magic Club, which is a big club out here, mm -hmm. uh, and George Carlin was performing. And I think every comic knew, hey, he's not going to be around much longer. Yeah. So uh, I invited my friend to come see him. And, uh, you know, this that's arguably the greatest comic of all time. For sure. And my friend walked out after five minutes. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, ah, I'm not feeling that guy. I'm going to go look for some pussy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this guy was a real hound. So uh, yeah. but, you know, so if people can walk out on George Carlin. I think they could walk out on you or me. Yeah, yeah. That's that a, <laughs> that a great point for sure. Dude, wait, have you met Ric Flair before? Never. Uh, Never, okay. Which is funny, the, uh, maybe about a month ago, I was on stage in the main room uh, at the store. And, uh, you know, it's a, I get the last spot usually, which is mm -hmm. affectionately, it's called three things. It's called the Kennison spot. Okay. That's the spot he used to get. And then it's called the Brody Stevens spot, because that's the spot he used to get. Yeah. And the Brian Holtzman spot. Uh, okay. Brian's a great comic. Uh, so it's an honor to get that last spot given who mm -hmm. has gotten it before me and uh so i'm doing my thing and it's a very tough spot because you got to understand it. it's literally like going on last in a gangbang you know you're like <laughs> clean you know, up they, they've seen every big name comic they've heard every yeah. bit of crowd work they can hear so you have to hit them over the head with a hammer and yeah so i'm doing pretty good one night and all the comics in the back are frantically waving at me like this and they're going like this and they're going like yeah. this and uh i thought they were fucking with me so i just kept doing my act and it turns out rick flair was in the hallway um dude and uh bruce gray one of the uh great comics who's a door guy at the store apparently he was if you've ever seen a picture of a comic on stage at the uh, main room yeah you know, the curtain behind him and mm -hmm. behind that curtain is like a little walkway and bruce was like dude i was in the walkway trying to tell you rick flair's in the hallway and uh <laughs> so uh it will be interesting that the first time i meet him i'm gonna be doing some pretty uh wacky jokes about him but yeah you know that's the thing about a roast if you sign up for it you know what's coming yeah yeah, yeah. i mean anyone that gets blindsided by a roast like I mean, what did you think? Which I'm sure well, there are people, people don't who get do. It. Well, no, no, I'm sure there are. I mean, I know like uh, what's her name, um, Fox News lady, Ann Coulter. Yeah, definitely didn't seem to be uh, in on it. But and, you know, like even the one with Chevy Chase, uh, you know, where Comedy Central did a Chevy Chase roast. Yeah, yeah. He's a legendary. Uh, you know, it's Chevy Chase, uh, yeah. OG cast member of SNL. It's game over. Caddyshack, yeah. Fletch um and you could tell during his roast that even a comic mind as great as his was like why the fuck are they saying these mean things about me i'm a legend <laughs> uh so um you know I, yeah. I think rick will be a good sport from what i understand yeah and, you know there's enough of his friends on the dais like eric bischoff and uh yeah. ddp and um uh, you know whoever else they get uh where He'll be in a safe space, I think. Yeah. Hey, if you had to get in a bar fight and you could only pick one wrestler to be your backup, who would it be? Uh, from what I understand, Haku. Uh, you know, who uh, uh -huh. Meng. Uh, you know, he, he went by a few names. But apparently Haku was literally the scariest uh, person, like, in a bar. Like, he, like, really? when people would fight, he would, like, literally knock guys out with a half of a punch. Uh um you know but but if haku wasn't available like literally that's a unanimous selection if you go uh -huh. on any uh wrestling podcast and they talk about who was the toughest guy off not off stage but uh you know off ring yeah they yeah all say haku really 
But okay. if he's not there, uh, yeah. that's a tough one, you know, because there's, I think the best strategy in a fight is to not get in one. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I would go on like some guy who's physically giant that would scare people away from, um, you know, like that guy in AEW, uh, Satnam Singh. You know, yeah. Seven four, like legit. That's a good one. Seven four, or, what was, uh, or like Kevin Nash. I mean, he's like seven one, isn't he? Yeah, he's a big dude. Kevin uh, Nash is huge. Yeah. You know, uh, Goldberg back in the day. Goldberg you know, is a great one. See, mine is Stone uh, Cold, just from being from Texas. I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, Stone, he's Stone uh, Cold is like obviously yeah you know, a hero. I would want the a Sid vicious, you know, type. That's uh, that's that's a good one. Yeah. Just a guy who's so fucking scary looking, people are going to go, it ain't worth it. Um, yeah. You know, or that huge black guy in WWE, Otis, I think is his name. Otis. Ooh, I, I don't know. watch a lot, but he's just, yeah. I don't watch WWE a lot. I, yeah. He's just gigantic black dude. Well, there's like Mark Henry. Mark Henry's a great yeah. one. Mark Henry's a great uh, yeah. choice. Um, I'm trying to think of other guys. Um, I'm trying to think an aid Wardlow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. just if if my friends were mouthing off to Wardlow and Wardlow looked over at me, I'd be like, "Hey guys, shut the fuck up." Um, uh, so, and yeah. smaller guys could do damage. You know, you take a guy like yeah. MJF, who's probably my size, mm-hmm. uh, you know, six one, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, in the in the last fight I ever got into, it was a hockey fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy was maybe five five, one fifty tops, and uh, you know I was probably running around that game a little yeah, much. Yeah. And he's, "What's your problem, dude?" And I thought, "Oh, I'm six one. I'm I got seven inches on this guy, probably fifty pounds." I'm like, "F you, buddy!" <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, he was a sheriff, and. So he did this weird thing. And for those of you just listening, uh, he pushed my, uh, with his right hand, he pushed my left shoulder. Uh-huh. It was like a uh, weird karate move. And the force of it was so much, he turned me around. And then yeah. he put me in a chokehold and he, he choked me unconscious. Jesus. Um, yeah, and then when brain. I woke yeah. up, well, I woke up, he had my glasses in his hands. <laughs> and uh, you know i have really bad vision um yeah and so i have my my glasses and i'm not trying to brag by saying this but uh you know my glasses at the minimum are five six hundred dollars because yeah. the prescription is so like they literally have to custom make frames to fit the prescription that yeah, i have yeah. um, right and he had the, my glasses in his hand i'm like dude those are really expensive please don't break them and he looked at me and goes, just settle down. I'm like, you got it, brother. Uh, so um, <laughs> I, I try not to fight at the age of 53. Yeah. I've The last time I got in a fight was in high school, and I got kicked in the back of the head. And I was like, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Well, I'm so. sure you get picked on just because you're a big dude. Uh, like, yeah. how tall are you? 6'3". And what, what, what are you at? 365. So, you know, if I'm feeling tough, I'm, I'm going to take on this dude. He's yeah. 6'3", 365. I'm going to kick his ass. Uh, yeah. you know, and then you It know, would be probably, a safe bet, to be honest. No, I, I have no reflexes, bro. Like, Me I'm either. I'm so fucking slow. Uh, dude, I can't fight at all. Like, which I think my size, like, has maybe helped me in a way of just maybe people thinking that I could. Oh, which, absolutely. Which I hope that they keep thinking that because the reality is that uh, I'm a you know big old pussy. But um, yeah, it is no, I I can't fight at all. Don't know what I'm doing. That's and my, good. Man. Yeah, and my brother's a cop, and I mean he is. I mean he can beat my ass and does all that kind of shit, like the little like whatever pressure point stuff. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? I well nowadays you don't want to fight because you don't know who has a gun, who has uh... yeah. You know, it's it's literally dangerous uh, you know, to fight these days because it ain't just fists. It's you know, you yeah. flip off someone on the freeway or on the street. You know, they, the likelihood of someone having a gun in their car is it's probably thirty to forty percent. Uh, oh, for sure. And you know, so I I, I diffuse any any time I've ever been 
close to getting into a fight, I diffuse it with humor. Um, oh, me too. Every time. Because, so, I mean, I used to get, like, picked on like crazy as a kid, obviously, you know. And, uh, yeah. yeah, just be like, well, I'm not going to be able to fight you. But I can probably say things that are, like, either, like, funny slash hurtful. And that will work for me. And yeah. Did. I mean, I'm much more of a... Uh, I mean, I don't, I haven't been in, I, I literally haven't been in a fight since that hockey fight. And that was probably 20 plus years ago, but uh, I'm really good at um, talking my way out of things. If, you know, yeah. You know, at, the, you know at, at a comedy club, you run into drunks all the time. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I've been uh, verbally challenged from the stage a few times, but uh yeah verbally i can hang with anyone so the odds are you're not going to be able to out roast me so uh, of course it can't happen you know i'm sure yeah. jeselnik would kill me but uh <laughs> you know i'm you know i can hurt you with words more than fists yeah yeah oh not yeah, you sure. just you know anyone well, yeah. probably too but yeah no i uh no same philosophy like it's gotten me out of a lot of situations i'm also good at like sneaking away which is pretty impressive right. i think for someone my size uh doing the old irish exit so that has helped me out a lot that helps i mean uh you know it's uh you know fighting is obviously a last resort uh you know i mean i remember one time probably the last time i ever really came close to getting into a fight was you know i live in west hollywood there's a lot of uh uh, bars and nightclubs where I, you know I, I literally live right behind them yeah and, uh i walk in my dog one night and these three pretty big dudes are walking the other way on the sidewalk and uh one of them stepped on my dog's foot by accident but they yeah. just kept walking and i'm like what the fuck oh that's they, fucked they all three turned around and the, the guy who stepped on lois's foot was like a little aggressive and he's like fuck you man and, I'm like, and i started heck? spitting off some jokes on these guys uh and then you know my you know I, it came pretty close to going down because uh, luckily yeah. the guy's two friends were holding him back but i started verbally uh roasting this guy and, and i think his friends uh were embarrassed uh, yeah, yeah, so that, yeah my verbal skills probably got me out of <laughs> potentially having to fight three guys so um congratulations was, yeah i mean it got to the point where i was thinking okay i gotta throw lois over this guy's balcony <laughs> so she won't get hurt um and yeah. you know, just start chucking punches and, and hopefully land uh but yeah. uh, i'm glad um my uh, verbal skills got me out of that one yeah oh hands down for sure all right last question before you sure. before you go i know we're running on time so if you could see any band go back in time see any band in their prime in concert who would it be let's see i mean i would love to see the original killers um because i've seen the killers before and they're an amazing band but it was not with the original four um, yeah uh let me see outside of that i would love to see being a kiss fan of the 80s i never got mm -hmm. to see them with benny benson Okay. And so I would love, I, I, you know, uh, because I think they only did about 70 shows in makeup with Vinny and Eric Carr. Okay. Uh, and uh, on the Creatures of the Night tour, uh, which was uh, poorly attended because, and it was a money disaster for them because they yeah. had that huge tank uh, that Eric Carr would drum on. And mm -hmm. uh, I, since Vinny was only in makeup for 70 shows, I, that would be the one uh, yeah. concert I wish I could transport back in time to. And I'm, I'm sure most people would be like, uh, you don't want to see Zeppelin or the, the Beatles. <laughs> you want to see, see Kiss with Vinny Vincent in makeup? Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting choice, but I wouldn't pick the fucking Beatles either. I mean, I'm a Beatles fan, like nothing against them, but I don't want to see them in concert. I go with um, actually Def Leppard, like original like 82 83 Def Leppard I miss mean, on this yeah it was original. Steve Clark and yeah it was uh, Steve Clark and like Rick Allen pre uh Rick yeah, but, both of them, so. yeah like that's toward to the top of my list like them, yeah I mean I, you know. I mean I did see Guns N' Roses in 91 but Matt Sorum was the drummer uh yeah not Steven Adler 
I mean, I do, which ironically enough, right after I saw them, I ended up living in a building with Steven Adler. Um, <laughs> so I'd like yeah. to see a prime Guns N' Roses, like the original, the classic lineup, like, you know, right around the time they did that show at the Ritz in 88. In yes. Uh, yeah. But, you know, that last, you know, when I saw them in 91 at the Forum uh, with Matt Sorum, it it, it, that, that's a top five concert that I've ever seen. And I've probably been to literally 500 concerts uh, yeah. because it was just such a great long story short. Um, I go there with a group of my friends. We didn't yeah. have tickets. We thought uh, I was with this rich kid. I mean, this kid's dad was a billionaire, but he also had illegal direct TV because that's just who this guy was. <laughs> uh, clearly he could afford to pay the hundred bucks a month, but yeah. The one thing I found about rich people is they love the game. Um, yeah, right. You know, so we go uh, up, we're knocking on every door. No one's answering. Uh, finally, we knock on the, a, the last door in the forum and this guy opens up the door and uh, my buddy, I think, whips out a couple hundred dollars. And uh, the guy's like, I can't take that. And my friend who like was like, what? Why not? And the guy looks at us and goes, because I'm a cop. <laughs> and he's like get the fuck out of here so we start walking away and then this group of kids tries to bum rush the guy you know just because they saw the door open and he kicks yeah. them all out and he yells at us hey guys come on in uh because he was cool he's like okay yeah, you yeah. guys were nice and so we got into guns and roses uh and i remember we walked in they were playing live and let die and to show you my one friend monty who is a top real estate agent now uh -huh. within two minutes of us being in the forum he's in the front row uh making out with some blonde Jesus. Um, me and my other buddy we literally sat at the opposite end of the stage my we were so far away from the stage my back was against the wall um, yeah and it was an amazing show i think they did like oh, close damn. to three hours i think wow. i believe skid row was the opening act i might be off on that damn that's amazing but, uh as great as it was i i'd still wish i'd seen them with steven adler yeah no i, I get you i mean i, I wouldn't say the same thing i definitely grew up in the wrong time i mean i would have to pay like 300 bucks to go see fucking vince neil read off of a teleprompter so yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's, uh, it's it's a little rough now, but I mean if you like '80s music, it's tough to yeah you know yeah. But you got to understand, like in the mid '80s, and if, you know, once again, I sound old, but you know, <laughs> I was, it's like Vietnam. I was there. Uh, <laughs> you know, you were literally concert tickets were fifteen bucks. Oh, I know. It's yeah. insane. Like I just paid because I'm friends with uh, a lot of people in Alice Cooper's band. That mm -hmm. front row, I, I think I paid two hundred dollars, which is a steal. But right but still the guy next to me paid 700 yeah yeah exactly <laughs> but uh you know back then i mean concert tickets i don't know how bands made money i mean they were uh so albums cheap. albums t-shirts and kisses album sales. Merch. yeah i mean there's no album sales you don't have any of that shit now so so well yeah i mean like motorhead still makes a good chunk of change a year and and i think the original members are all dead but everyone yeah, wants a motorhead them. shirt you know yeah um, for sure the logo uh so uh you know it's just nowadays uh you know like when i saw the killers and weezer it was like at a music festival and i, I mm -hmm. we weren't in the front row but we were pretty close this is like three or four hundred bucks a ticket you know yeah. uh, uh the last few times i've seen kiss i sat in the front row it was close to a thousand dollars a ticket um you know yeah. was back in mid 80s to see the creatures of the night tour would have mm -hmm. been to sit in the front row if you if you got the tickets before the scalpers did 25 yeah. bucks like it's <laughs> insane yeah it, it is amazing that like the inflation rate on tickets is like so ridiculous like yeah i paid oh, like 250 for like decent rolling stones tickets i mean and i've paid 200 to go see like Marilyn Manson and Smashing Pumpkins, which not an ideal. It was not great. I'll say that, but you know, it was just, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I can only imagine what concerts will be like in 
uh, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, the prices, uh, you know, I, I don't know how people can afford to go to concerts, to be honest with you. No. no. I, mean, I went to uh, see Guns N' Roses, uh, I think it was about a year ago at the new soccer stadium in uh, Compton. Yeah. Personally, not where I would have put the arena, but uh, <laughs> uh, I know. But it was insane. Yeah. I mean, parking was sixty dollars, um, and it kind of reminded me of the old days when I would see Raider games at the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where uh, there wasn't a great parking around the Coliseum, so you had to literally park on people's lawns. Yeah, and they would shake you down for money. They would be like, uh. You know, you can park down the street for 20 bucks, but your car probably won't be there. You can give me 60. I'll look after your car. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, at the new soccer stadium, uh, it's called Bank of California. Stadium. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's not that many parking lots around. So mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it's total. Uh, what, what do you call it? I, I, I'm drawing a blank on the word, of course, but it's total gouging. It's price gouging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, that... Uh, you know the parking should be 20 bucks tops yeah uh, see at&t stadiums like fucking ridiculous in dallas like, oh yeah I, love, I mean the parking's fucking ridiculous well i just and, saw uh when i went to aew at um the forum um, uh, -huh. uh and i was all excited because i'd never seen sting live before and he, it, it turns yeah. out he was hurt so he wasn't there Damn. but you had to park at sofi stadium which is our AT and T stadium? Yeah, right, right, next right. To each other. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. And uh, it was, I think, sixty bucks to park. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, I was sad. It made me sad because it, it, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but it hit me that you know, I uh, my parents were in the horse racing industry, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a racetrack out here called Hollywood Park. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, you know, when my parents passed away many, many moons ago, I, I kind of fell out of liking horse racing, but it, yeah. so I'm, I'm parking at SoFi stadium and I'm looking around going, God, it's total deja vu feeling of, uh, some of the buildings. And I'm like, oh mm -hmm. my God, this is where Hollywood park used to be. Like it was literally, yeah. you know, they bulldozed it and built this amazing stadium, but uh, I kind of got all sad reminiscent yeah. about it. Uh, you know, many, many great memories with my parents going to the racetrack. Yeah. Damn. No, that's, yeah, I didn't know that. Like, I know, like, the SoFi, because it was it like in Inglewood or something like that, or Carson? Yeah, in, uh, or, downtown Inglewood. So you've yeah. got the Forum. Uh, and then uh, I guess it would be uh, to the left of the Forum uh -huh. is this, like, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stadium. Uh, yeah. But uh, Hollywood Park was, uh, a beautiful racetrack but uh you know it's it's gone so yeah it's kind of a bummer. hey oh well, man but yeah dude um you know i don't want to take up too much of your time man but like i i really appreciate you coming on had a oh, blast yeah. talking with you good luck on the roast i like i'm looking forward to you know seeing it i can't wait oh, i can't i'm excited like uh you know i mean I, of course a lot of people know me from the tv show roast battle yeah which, was never really my sense of humor to look at someone and call them fat or old or ugly <laughs> or, or you're a whore. Uh, so roasting, you, you know, is different because, you know, roast battle, you're, it's basically skilled bullying. Um, yeah. And yeah. Whereas roasting is, yeah, she says some mean things, but then you also pay tribute at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Like, you know, I get to make fun of Eric Bischoff but at the end, I'm going to go up to him and go, dude, I'm a huge fan. Like, right. Thank you for all the memories you gave me. Um, it's a show of appreciation. Like, yeah. Really. It's really a tribute. Like obviously yeah. every, every comic on the dais and like, I'm a huge hockey fan. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll say mean things about Ty Domi, but I'll wrap it up going, dude, you were one of my favorite players. And, you yeah. know, obviously with Ric Flair, I'm going to make fun of his marriages and his, you know, other things i don't want yeah. to give it away uh <laughs> but at the end i'm yeah. gonna be like dude you're the you're the greatest of all time thank right. you for having me and he'll probably yeah. look at me and go who the fuck are you but uh <laughs> you know i'll yeah. deal with that when i deal with it exactly well hey i mean the best of luck to you i mean i'm sure you're gonna fucking kill it and i mean, I mean that's uh, a hell of a place to be 
like uh, Steven Seagal said in Under Siege 2, mm, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. And uh, let's just say I'm very prepared. I have never ended a show with a Seagal quote, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I do. I, I, uh, I just get this thing together. Uh, I appreciate you uh, doing this and uh, working around my wacky schedule. Hey, so No uh, worries. So let's do this again. We didn't even talk about half the shit we could have. Dude, I, I, I was thinking about it, too. Like I was like, man, there's a lot of shit that I kind of wanted to cover. But, hey, another time, oh, another conversation, man. But everybody follow Earl wherever you can. Um, dude's, dude's a fucking legend. So, Earl, right, appreciate that. Peace out, man. Take it easy. Hope to see you soon, brother.